After the making of Eden came a serpent, and after the gorgeous furnishing of the world, a human being. Why the existence of the destroyers? What monstrous folly, think you, ever led nature to create her one great enemy? Man. Before his coming, security may have been. But how soon she learned the meaning of fear when this new Oedipus of her brood was brought forth. And how instinctively she taught the fear of him to the rest of her children. Today, after centuries of association, every bird and beast and creeping thing, the wolf in the forest, the antelope on the plain, the wild fowl on the sedge, fly from his approach. They know his civilization means their destruction. Even the grizzly, secure in the chaparral of his mountain home, flinches as he crosses the white man's trail. The boot mark in the dust smells of blood and iron. The great annihilator has come and fear travels with him. Familiar facts, he will say. Yes, and not unfamiliar the knowledge that with the coming of civilization, the grasses and the wildflowers perish, the forest falls and its place is taken by brambles, the mountains are blasted in the search for minerals, the plains are broken by the plow, and the soil is gradually washed into the rivers. Last of all, when the forests have gone, the rain cease falling, the streams dry up, the ground parches and yields no life, and the artificial desert, the desert made by the tramp of human feet, begins to show itself. Yes. Everyone must have cast a backward glance and seen nature's beauties beaten to ashes under the successive marches of civilization. The older portions of the earth show their desolation plainly enough, and the ascending smoke and dust of the ruin have even tainted the air and dimmed the sunlight. You will not be surprised, then, if, in speaking of desert, mesa, and mountain, I once more take you far beyond the wire fence of civilization, to those places, unhappily few now, where the trail is unbroken and the mountain peak unblazed. I was never over fond of park and garden nature study. If we would know the great truths, we must seek them at the source. The sandy wastes, the arid lands, the porphyry mountain peaks may be thought profitless places for pilgrimage. But how often have you and I, and that one we both loved so much, found beauty in neglected marshes, in wintry forests, and in barren hillsides? The love of nature is, after all, an acquired taste. One begins by admiring the Hudson River landscape and ends by loving the desolation of Sahara. Just why or how the change would be difficult to explain. You cannot always dissect a taste or a passion. Nor can you pin nature to a board and chart her beauties with square and compasses. One can give his impression, and but little more. Perhaps I can tell you something of what I have seen in these two years of wandering. But I shall never be able to tell you the grandeur of these mountains, nor the glory of color that wraps the burning sands at their feet. We shoot arrows at the sun in vain, yet still we shoot.